This video is about the um, impact of corporate debt on um, stockholders. The video is brought to you by PolarisInvesting.com, a site for creating defensible valuations. As a reminder, business valuation is based on expectations derived from the skillful consideration of past facts and future possibilities. The real focus of, of, of the video is on this well-known formula of the return that a stockholder can expect. Uh, it's also uh, derived from what is referred to as the Modigliani and Miller Proposition 2. But we're going to be going into the uh, meaning behind the formula and uh, also uh, for those interested they can stay on and wa watch the, uh, the, the, how this formula is actually derived. Now the formula is based on uh, well-known uh, propositions one and two, which I show over here to the right, that were created by Franco Medigliani and Merton Miller way back in uh, 1958 when they were young professors at Carnegie Mellon University in, in uh, Pittsburgh. Proposition one relates the value of a leveraged company to an unleveraged company. Proposition 2 relates the cost of equity of a leveraged company to an unleveraged company. The propositions deal with two scenarios, with taxes and without taxes. Actually, the, the without taxes scenario is just a special case of the with taxes scenario where the tax rate is zero. The diagram on the right shows the two scenarios and the two propositions applied to each scenario. As you can see, setting the tax rate T to zero in the with taxes scenario is the same as shown for the without taxes scenario. In this video, we are talking about the scenario where taxes T is greater than zero. Therefore, we are looking at this diagram here, which is also shown over here to the left. I'd like to focus your attention here to the text below the diagram. It says here that Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1 in the scenario of, of t with taxes states that the value of a leveraged firm equals the value of a firm with, with no leverage or no debt, but plus the tax rate times the outstanding debt. Uh, and uh, again, towards the end of this video, if you choose to uh, continue watching, we'll show the, the, the derivation of that. But that is... Uh, Again, McDingleon and Miller, Proposition 1 in the scenario of, of taxes. And I'd like to point out that uh, in the development of their propositions, they use the terms KS to represent uh, the rate of return to a, a stockholder of a leveraged firm, and then uh, KU is the uh, value of the return to a stockholder of an unleveraged firm. There's some other um, references uh, that will use KL instead of KS, but uh, just keep in uh, mind. Uh, KL and KS both refer to the stock return of a, of, of a leveraged uh, company. Well, Mendigliani and Miller went further. They uh, used this relationship uh, in such a way that they were able to show that as it relates to capital budgeting, which again we'll get into later, you can show that the weighted average cost of capital is equal to this formula shown here. But it's based on Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1 to get to this uh, conclusion. And then um, you, you actually see that here in the diagram above, that the weighted average cost of capital uh, is this line here. Now the way uh, you can somewhat rationalize it or uh, see why that is true is that the straight line Modigliani and uh, Miller assume that the uh, rate for debt that you're, uh, doesn't change even as you take on more and more debt relative to the uh, equity in the company that the that KB stays constant so therefore a straight line. Now later on we're going to get into a, a newer theory called static theory of corporate finance of which that um, uh, constant KB is relaxed and and it's more realistic to assume that as more debt is assumed uh, becomes a higher proportion of, of outstanding uh, equity 
that actually the uh, uh, rate on your debt would go up over time. Uh, but well, Digliani and Miller did not assume an increasing cost of debt as uh, debt increases is just uh, uh, assumed to be fixed. Therefore, the straight line is the after-tax uh, cost of, or rate of, of debt. Right above that is an unleveraged stock return after tax, and it's more just a, a, a reference line, but it's also a straight line, assuming that the unleveraged uh, stock return doesn't change based on the amount uh, of debt. Well, it won't because it's, it's unleveraged. There assumed to be no debt, so uh, increasing debt in this diagram has no impact on, on that line. So you can see here that if, if, if you assume that the, uh, for now, this little straight this uh, line here represents this formula up here. You can see that as you add more and more debt and you move further and further up on this line, that when you combine the cost of equity and the cost of debt, since debt stays constant, this starts to increase. As you increase debt, a higher and higher proportion of the overall weighted, weighted average cost of uh, capital is made up of debt, which is a lower number. And even though you have a, a slightly increasing cost of equity, it still causes the weight of, uh, weighted average cost of capital to drop and then eventually kind of flatline as you get so much of, of the uh, proportion of, of total capital structure is debt that uh, it just pretty much stays flat <coughs> uh, when you get an extreme amount of debt. Well, using the results of uh, the uh, Proposition 1 uh, with taxes, Vigliani and Miller were able to then go on to Proposition 2 and uh, der derive this formula that we that we see here in, in the diagram that, that reiterate that it does assume a, a constant KB as, as, the, uh, as you increase the amount of, of debt, the rate on that debt stays constant. Now doing some, some algebraic uh, manipulation, you can uh, turn this formula uh, around and, calc and determine what KU equals based on KS. Uh, now KU, which is the unleveraged uh, rate of return uh, on, on uh, equity or stock, is not directly observable, meaning that you cannot take a company that currently has leverage and then compare it to a company just like it that doesn't have leverage. That's just not possible. So what you do is you, you, you look at a company and uh, you calculate its market value of debt, its market value of stock, what the current average rate of uh, its paying on its debt, and then using something like the capital asset pricing model, you determine what its current um, uh, return on equity that the, that the market is expecting, and then plug those into this formula, and then you can com uh, compute a, uh, an unleveraged equivalent unleveraged rate of return on stock. And then once you have that, you then plug it into the formula up above and uh, then able to, as you uh, increase debt, determine what the new uh, cost of equity must be based on the uh, increased amount of debt. Now what's interesting about Digliani and Miller Proposition 2 is that it, it doesn't really uh, have any direct statement to say about volatility or, or riskiness of a stock. It's just simply making an observation about the mathematical relationship between increased debt and what, an, uh, what the impact would be to the cost of equity. Now we know from the capital asset pricing model that the underlying the cost of equity is the volatility metric beta that quantifies risk. It can be shown that the Minigliani and Miller 1 WAP formula and the Minigliani and Miller 2 formula can be derived using the capital asset pricing model. Thus, there is consistency between the Minigliani and Miller results and the capital asset pricing model. Both approaches show that an increase in risk increases the stock's expected return. Now, Minigliani and Miller did not use price volatility in deriving their results. Rather, this is pure our algebraic result that we'll show in, in the uh, second half of this video if you're interested in uh, continuing to watch uh, through the derivation piece. And then uh, once you have this relationship here, uh, then you can, you can restate uh, 
the weighted average cost of capital as it was derived under Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1. You can restate it as uh, the more well-known def- uh, formula for weighted average cost of capital. Now, before proceeding, I want to make sure that it's understood that the derivation of the well-known weighted average cost of capital formula is a, a direct result of the income statement. And as a refresher, here's a straightforward uh, example of an income statement. And the net operating income is at this point in the income statement. So from there down, there's a relationship between net income and net operating income, which is shown over here. The net income is net operating uh, income after taxes, but subtracting off the cost of debt after taxes. You can see that net income, subtract off debt, taxes, and that puts us right back at net operating income. Well, once you have that, you can do some uh, simple addition and subtraction from both sides, and you see that net operating income is equal to this. Well, then you can uh, look at it from an economic perspective. You can say, well, if we were to define something called weighted average cost of capital and multiply it by the invested capital, represented by debt, uh, the value of debt and the value of stock, it's got to equal to the tax advantaged interest payment to debt holders plus the expected return to stockholders. This assumes current market prices for, for debt and stock are rational and no growth in value is expected, namely, it's expected the return on investment capital equals the weighted average cost of capital. And then dividing both sides by B plus S, you get the well-known weighted average cost of capital. And make note that this is derived without any Manigliano and Miller results. Well, with that background, let's, let's uh, focus in on the um, main purpose of, of this video, is to go through this formula here, derived from what is uh, referred to as the Manigliani and Miller Proposition 2. Namely, what is the expected rate of return that a stockholder should expect from a company that, that um, has debt? Well, there's four components of the formula that I uh, want to break out separately. The first one is the fact that it is uh, made up of um, the unlevered rate of return. And as we mentioned earlier, that's not observ directly observable, so you have to go... Uh, and, and derive it based on what we uh, discussed earlier. Then you add to that uh, the after tax. So there is a tax benefit from debt. And so it's the after tax portion of the debt that now you add on to uh, the unlevered rate of uh, stock return. And you multiply that by the difference between the unlevered rate of return and the average rate of debt and that difference is essentially a wealth transfer between debt and stockholders now when the, when the, uh, uh, the cost of debt is below what the unlevered rate of return that's uh, being made by the company then you, you it's a wealth transfer from debt holders to the stockholders but if that unlevered rate of return uh, in a distressed kind of company would be below what the rate of return is on, on debt, then it's actually a, a wealth transfer the other way around. And then the company is actually destroying value by borrowing and then earning a, a rate of return lower than uh, the, the rate that they borrow at. So this discussion is assuming uh, when we say benefit to the stockholder is that the unlevered rate of return is assumed is greater than the, the cost of, uh, of debt. And then you multiply that by uh, really the magnitude or the leverage amount that you're using, namely what is, how much debt do you have relative to the overall amount of stock. With a change to the debt equity ratio, the stock return of a highly levered company changes significantly based on the difference between the unlevered stock return and the cost of debt. And so again, four components, unobservable amount, after tax, the wealth transfer com component, and then the magnitude or the leverage goes into how what is the rate of return that uh, 
can be expected as you increase the amount of debt. Well, next, we want to talk about what does this really mean to a stockholder? What, what, what is this? We've broken the formula. We've talked a little bit about the background of the formula, and uh, we broke it up into its four main pieces. But what does it really mean to a stockholder? How does it change maybe you, you, what kind of stocks you would look for? Well, what it's showing is that if you can find a company that, that consistently can earn uh, a rate of return that's above its uh, cost of debt, that, and if you can find a company that's, that's uh, increasing the, the amount of debt, it'll show that you, that you can expect an increasing return on, on your um, stock investment. And to show you uh, how profitable this can be, this kind of thing was first done in a big way back in the 80s through uh, what was now called leveraged buyouts. But in 1984, there was a uh, hedge fund or a private equity company called WES Ray. And they identified a company called Gibson Greeting Cards uh, that was pulling in just normal expected earnings year over year. Just a good solid performer. But they went out and, and uh, looked into the free cash flow and debt and all the things that, that, uh, that we've been talking about as it goes into this calculation. And they determined that Gibson greeting cards uh, was actually consistently generating revenue and creating enough free cash flow to easily cover debt, debt and what little growth uh, they, they were experiencing. In other words, that their, their rate of return was well above on their on their projects was well above the weighted average cost of capital, and that they could easily accommodate more debt without significantly impacting um, their free cash flow, and therefore they could borrow the majority of the money needed to uh, buy the company. This is called a uh, leveraged buyout, and get a big uh, rate of return uh, as stockholders. So what they did is they uh, bought Gibson greeting cards for. Uh, 81 million dollars, and at that time, Gibson's uh, greeting cards was pulling in about 300 million in annual sales, but uh, very uh, expected earnings from those sales. The uh, private equity firm themselves invested uh, 650 thousand dollars out of that 81 million. They, they borrowed the rest, and uh, within uh, a couple years, they floated. Uh, 10 million shares at $27.50 per share uh, to the public markets. In other words, took the company public again. And it ended up yielding a private equity company a $66 million gain. And you consider they put in 650000 of their own money. This was a hundredfold return on investment over about a two or three year period. So they got a lot of attention, and, and that's why we saw a big boom in leveraged buyouts. And that's kind of run its course over the uh, in, uh, last couple of decades. But even today, you as an individual investor, if you can find companies like uh, Gibson Greeting Cards that has stable, consistent revenue that's generating uh, free cash flow and, and, and uh, high return on, on uh, uh, uh capital investment well above the rate of uh, rate on on debt and you can see signs that the company is taking on increasing debt it, it's a, a fairly straightforward way to assure higher rates of return for you the stockholder going forward well, one last thing i want to mention before we get into the derivation of the these formulas we've been talking about and and that is uh, i want to talk about the this this concept of the static theory of corporate finance and I uh, briefly alluded to it at the beginning of, the, of this video is that if, if you relax the uh, assumption about constant cost of debt as the, you increase the amount of debt and and more realistically assume that there is going to be an increase in the cost of debt as you increase the amount of debt in a company then you end up with a, a what's called static line of, of uh, uh, static theory of corporate finance, and to explore that a little bit more, I'm going to uh, 
show this here and uh, leave it up to you to read the text at the bottom of what I'm showing here to the right. But it's similar to the uh, diagram that we've been looking uh, at up till now. But uh, what it's showing is a little bit different is that instead of a, a straight line for the cost of equity, because debt now, and, and also a straight line for cost of debt, you now have, as debt becomes an ever-increasing proportion of overall capital, capital structure, the cost of debt goes up. And because it goes up, it also causes the cost of equity not to go up in a linear fashion, but now to go up more like it's being shown here. And then when you calculate the weighted average cost of capital, you end up with a uh, uh, an optimal amount of, of debt and equity because after a certain point, your cost of your debt gets so high that, that now it drives the weight, weighted average cost of capital up even higher. So it shows that typically, as long as a company is in the range of 20 to 50 percent debt to equity, they're within the range of, of an optimal capital structure. But when you go much above 50 percent of your capital structure being debt, or if you're much below 20 percent of your capital structure of debt, then you're in suboptimal range. But if you're in, in between 20 to 50 percent, then, then you are hitting a specific or static optimal capital structure of which this theory of uh, called uh, static theory of corporate finance uh, uh, alludes to. Now, this is more conceptual in, in, in its uh, approach, and there's not specific formulas like we had here with the Medigliano and Miller propositions, but it, uh, it does align with reality better. But the Medigliano and Miller propositions are a good foundation and it's still appropriate way to, to think about particularly the, this this formula here about what the impact of increasing debt is. Since this video was originally recorded, a spreadsheet has been created that takes the structure of the Menigliani and Miller results and applies them to the static theory of capital structure. The spreadsheet is organized by dividing up the range of debt to capital structure into three groups, with each group having its own cost of debt. <clears throat> For example, the middle group has a cost of debt of 4.5% and ranges from 60 to 85% uh, debt to capital. And with the uh, current debt to capital of 75% shown here. Group to the right goes from 85% up to 90 with a cost of debt of 6%. And then the lower group here goes from 20 to 60% with a cost of debt of 3%. Cost of debt is co considered constant in each range. Said a different way, the cost of debt does not change over the range of debt to capital being considered. This is a major assumption in the Bedigliano and Miller results. Down below is a graph that shows the results across the three ranges. So for instance, in this left group, we have um, after-tax cost of debt of 2.4%, so that's shown here. And then you can see here that uh, as you add more debt, the co weighted average cost of capital drops. But the uh, cost of uh, equity goes up. This middle group, after-tax cost is 3.6%. Weighted average cost of capital goes down. Um, as you add more debt in that range, and the cost of equity goes up. And then this third group, um, as... Um, more debt is added, the way the cost of capital goes down, the cost of equity goes up. Let's get into the details of the spreadsheet. As, me as mentioned, this middle group is a range of debt to capital around the current debt to capital structure. So here we are, the current values, and then the range that we're going to go up to this high range and, th and this low range. Now, the values that uh, are in each row are broken up into 
four major steps. So the values here in this first step are really kind of uh, uh, intermediate values that are going to be used in subsequent steps. Uh, anything uh, with a gray background in a cell represents a user input. So here in the middle group, uh, the current debt, cost of debt, is entered here and it's 4.5%. The next row has the risk-free rate, which is entered once up here and it pertains to all three groups of 2.5%. The reason it's repeated down here is that uh, we'll see later on it is possible to change that uh, value specific to a, a, a group, so it's repeated. Next value is uh, entered in by the user. It is the um, debt to capital ratio. And then this uh, next value is the equity to capital ratio. Uh, next calculation is done to calculate the after-tax cost of debt and then um, the debt to equity ratio is calculated. With those values now calculated, we move on to the next step, which is to calculate the cost of equity and the weighted average cost of capital using the well-known formula for weighted average, average cost of capital. Before that, do calculate the levered beta using this formula and then uh, unlever the beta. Now, the, 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 here in, uh, when we get started, the current beta is looked up on a, a website and entered in. In other places on the spreadsheet, this value is calculated and then an unlevered beta is calculated. Next, calculate the uh, cost of equity using the capital asset pricing model, and then calculate the weighted average cost capital. Now, the reason the capital asset pricing model is used to calculate the cost of equity in the current state is that we uh, need a way to get started. And the capital asset pricing model is a, a reasonable way to uh, kind of seed the initial uh, cost of capital. All right, so then we move on to the next step, and, and it's separate, uh, which is to calculate the unlevered cost of equity. And that's an important step, so it uh, only consists of the, of the one calculation. And it uses the Migliano and Miller uh, formula to calculate the, the unlevered cost of equity. Then we get into the final step, which is the forecasting step, which we take um, the cost of equity and then apply this formula and come up with it, uh, which should be the same value that we got before for the cost of equity. And then when we uh, do a, a forecast based on uh, changing the, the debt to capital ratio, we, we get this number. Now these will be equal when you're talking about the current, but when we change the uh, debt to capital, it'll, it'll, the forecast number will obviously be different based on that different debt to capital. So we can see here for this uh, middle range that we do see a weighted average cost of capital go down as we move up from a 60% debt to capital all the way to 85 debt to capital. And so we go from 4.8% uh, to 4.7% and then down to 4.6%. And the cost of equity increases from 6.7%, uh, 7.9%, and then all the way up to 10%. Now what we just discussed is seen in the graph right below <clears throat> this middle section, namely the cost of uh, equity goes up and the weighted average cost of capital goes down. Also shows that we do have a fixed after-tax cost of debt through this entire range. The combined view in this graph down here shows this result here in the 60 to 85 range. 
where your average cost of capital goes down, cost of equity goes up. Now, one other thing I want to mention real quick is this: these values here that are calculated are only there just for uh, validation. That once we do the forecast, we loop back up here and say, okay, based on this uh, forecasted cost of equity, what is the levered beta, and then what ends up being the unlevered beta, and then just uh, want to make sure that uh, through all these different ranges uh, and different debt to capital, we, we have the same unlevered beta. And so it's just more for validation. Now these other two numbers will be grayed out most of the time. And uh, if we change this to KB, it, th they'll be shown. But we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later in, in, in this section. Okay, next we want to consider what other values for, for uh, debt interest rate do we want to consider in these other uh, ranges. So off here to the right it shows uh, currently what the U.S. Treasury yield curve is. It's showing what the U.S. government can borrow at, which uh, obviously corporates, corporations can't, but it gives you a feel for uh, kind of where interest rates are, and they are uh, extremely low right now. Then to the right of this is uh, different uh, credit Bureau ratings, uh, Moody's, Standards and Poor's, and Fitch ratings, but they all have some high quality rating down to what's considered non investment grades. And then over here we see uh, different interest rates uh, that most companies can get depending on how their uh, businesses are, are, are rated. Uh, higher quality can get down below 2%. And non-investment grade interest rates are around 6% and higher. So a reasonable upper range to consider is 6% based on these numbers. And then a lower range might even be as low as 2%. But considering we're starting here from a current environment of 4.5%, just going to consider 3%. Okay, next going to focus in on this this upper range where we use a constant cost of debt of six percent and the range is it goes from uh, 85 percent to 90 percent cost uh, or uh, an 85 to 90 debt to capital ratio just a reminder this middle range went from started off at 75 and we lowered it a little bit to 60 and then up to 85 so this range is just picking up at 85 and this going up to 90. It does use values that are common across the three ranges to calculate other values. Um, so I'm not going to go through each calculation because they're, they're uh, similar to what we did in, in the middle group. What we end up with is a uh, unlevered cost of capital of 7% and then we forecast from that up to this 90% debt to uh, capital get a 13.8 percent cost of equity and then a forecasted uh, weighted average cost of coffee. capital of uh, 5.7 percent. We loop back up and take this uh, cost of equity and calculate the levered beta and then unlever the beta and just make sure it stays at uh, 0.35. The graph below there shows that uh, as we increase the amount of debt that uh, the cost of equity goes from 11.3% up to 13.8%. So it goes up and the weight average cost of capital drops slightly from 5.8% to 5.7% and we're using a constant after-tax cost of, of debt of 4.8%. Uh, then we roll that result into this combined view and we see the weighted average cost of capital drop, the cost of equity go up for this range. Okay, now we look at this uh, last range here to the left where the range goes uh, from where the middle range left off at 60% down to 20%. I'm not going to go through the calculations because they're the same as we saw in these other groups. What we end up with is 
a uh, with a 20% debt to capital, you end up with a uh, cost of equity of 4.6% and a weighted average cost of equity of 4.2. And then we raise it up to 60% debt to uh, capital. The uh, cost of equity rises to 6, but the weighted average cost of capital drops to 3.8%. See this in the graph, the cost of equity and goes up as you uh, increase the amount of debt, but the weighted average cost of capital drops, and then the after-tax cost of debt stays constant at 2.4%. Uh, so now we see all three of these ranges in the roll-up view down here, and this latest low range is down here with the weighted average co cost of capital dropping, and then the uh, cost of equity going up. Now notice in this group the low weighted average cost of capital is actually the lowest across all the groups. And therefore it's the optimal or minimum weighted average cost of capital for the three groups that are being, being considered. And the weighted average cost of capitals that were considered are shown here in orange, namely here at the 20% uh, debt to capital and then this is in yellow because it's the optimal, but it would be orange otherwise at 60%. And then uh, also at 60%, but at a higher cost of debt is 4.8. And then here at 75%, debt to capital is 4.7 whack. And then uh, up at 85 is 4.6, raise the interest rate of debt. Uh, and then go to uh, 85 and we get uh, 5.8% uh, and then go all the way up to 90 and you get 5.7. So up here the uh, minimum whack is displayed in yellow and then uh, where it is across these different ranges is also shown in yellow and again it was selected from the cells that are in orange. Now right bef below that is the change in value of the company. If uh, you, the company moves from a 75% uh, debt to capital ratio of 4.5% interest rate on debt to a 60% debt to capital structure but an interest rate of 3% on debt. That lowers the WAC from 3.8% to what it uh, originally starts out at 4.7%. 4 and that calculation is just simply realizing that uh, current value is net operating income after tax divided by the WAC. So if you change the WAC, you get a new value and then you just uh, do the math to get the uh, change in overall value of the company. Since the spreadsheet was originally created, a new section has been added that forecasts the stock value as a result of changing the debt to capital ratio. Forecast evaluation is based on this well-known uh, free cash flow to the firm business valuation formula where you take the net operating income after tax, apply some uh, distribution rate which is one minus the reinvestment rate which is a reinvestment rate is that uh, percent sign and then you divide that by the WAC minus the return expected on projects times the uh, reinvestment rate where small r and the percent multiplied together is the growth <coughs> this expected of uh, net operating income going forward. Now, if you assume that return on future projects, namely that small r, is exactly equal to the WAC, then the formula greatly simplifies because the uh, 1 minus reinvestment rate cancels out of the numerator and the denominator, and you're left with the formula that's shown here. Well, after the business value is calculated, then you can just take the debt to equity ratio that's calculated over here, because uh, we're assuming this is the current uh, environment, and then uh, you can figure out the uh, portion of that that's uh, value related to the stock, value related to the uh, bond. By the way, just recalculate over here to verify we are getting the same percentages that we had here. 
And then the share value is just simply the portion of the business value that relates to the stock divided by the number of shares outstanding. Now the share value, because it's based on the business value valuation formula, has built into it the assumption that the company is at equilibrium, meaning that its return on projects is exactly equaling the weighted average cost of capital. So when you go out and compare this current share value with the current price, it's not surprising that it's likely not going to match. One of the uh, most obvious reasons for not matching is the market is currently having a different assessment about the likely future returns on projects and possibly expecting future projects to return slightly above the current weighted average cost of capital. Or there just could be other emotional drivers that are causing the current price to be different than uh, the calculated uh, share value. Now, other things you should look at is whether the net operating income, which is normalized, which means that uh, you're assuming that it represents the current business situation and it's likely something that you can expect to uh, go forward. And a way to uh, look at that is go out to a site like Reuters, look at the uh, financials, and you can look at the uh, operating income here over the last several years. And you can see that f for this company, it has bounced around quite a bit, which is normal for most companies. And then the, the art of uh, valuation is trying to decide, well, what's kind of to be expected going for the normal operating income. So um, right now we're using 450 as the normalized. Uh, but if we were to change that to some other value, like uh, 500, you would see that that would start to approach the current price. So I'm going to leave it at 500. We're still not matching the current price. Well, some of the other inputs that were put in is the number of uh, outstanding shares. And that can be seen here if you go look at the balance sheet. And um, you're looking at the number of, uh, of shares that are outstanding. And uh, it's varied quite a bit. It looks like this company has been buying back a fair number of shares. So what is the number of shares you should use currently? Right now we're assuming 100, but maybe it would be more realistic to assume that even more aggressive buyback. And we can change this to something uh, like 95. Then that ups the fewer shares outstanding divided by the value of this uh, that we've calculated four shares it ups the price so we we start we're starting to match the price a little bit more other input values that we've used is uh, the current uh, market yield on outstanding debt we've assumed is four and a half percent need to check to see if that's accurate or not. Uh, not going to do that for now. But the other big uh, input is the debt to total capital ratio. And um, do the same thing. Go out here and we can look at the uh, outstanding long-term debt, um, which is about $5 uh, billion for this company. And then go look at the uh, market cap which represents the um, current value of the stock, and then decide whether that ratio is correct. We're using uh, 75 to 25, but based on those numbers, it looked like uh, what the current pricing is, is more like 65. So now we get into uh, a value that's pretty darn close to the current price. One other thing that needs to be reviewed as well is, is the beta that's being used that eventually determines the cost of equity which is used in the weighted average cost of capital. So um, you can go off to this site and um, also look at what the current uh, beta, so this is saying 1.35, but uh, value we're currently using is 1.20. So if we were to change it to 1.35, it would uh, lower the value a little bit, but it would almost get it exactly to the uh, current price. Now before going through the calculations involved with the optimal share value, I'm going to come over here and make a, a change here. And the result of this change is really 
forces the calculations to stay within this range here. And you can see here it identifies the optimal WAC to be 5.1% uh, within this range. And the reason I want to uh, do that is that keeps the discussion within the normal uh, Mendigliano and Miller results. And, and we, uh, for, for now, we'll ignore these other two ranges and just focus on, on the middle range. So with the optimal WAC of 5.1%, see here that uh, he goes ahead and calculates a, a business value based on that new WAC. The, uh, looks at what the, uh, for that new WAC, what the uh, split is between debt and equity. So then it takes that value and splits it up between debt and equity. And then there's a, a little more that's got to be considered because as we move from the current uh, environment to this new split, we are repurchasing some stock with additional debt, thus lowering the number of outstanding shares. And then what we end up with is a share value that's slightly higher than the share value we currently have. And that is what you would expect, that as you increase the amount of debt with the same cost of debt, that that tax advantage of, of additional debt will go to the remaining stockholders. They will benefit from the tax deduction of debt. So as seen in the graph, the weighted average cost of capital drops, namely in this case from 5.3 to 5.1. Keep your debt constant. Yes, the cost of equity does go up. We went from 13, we're up to 13.6 now, whereas we started out with 8.6. But the big advantage is that uh, the stock price will go up about 14%. To avoid having to force um, the focus to only be on this middle range by, by setting this value to 6, a new section has been added over here that lets you to focus in on that middle range without having to force it. In addition to allowing you to focus on the middle range, it also allows you to, to see what the impact would be if uh, expectations were exceeded. It shows you when the uh, return on invested capital equals the weighted average cost of capital and what the comparable uh, return on equity would be which would also equal the cost of equity. But if you were to exceed it now, you can start seeing what the change to stock prices would be based on um, how far you, you think that it may be exceeded. So for example here, we've set this to 85%, which is exactly what we were doing before. So uh, when you're sitting here at equilibrium, price is $19.19, .19, just like we saw here. So the difference is this is showing us the current and this the, up here is showing you what where you want to go to, and then you just sim simply enter in the new uh, debt to capital ratio that you're interested in. So right now at 85, it's uh, essentially showing us the same thing that we're seeing here. We can lower it to 60, but the other advantage over here is we're no longer limited by just the 60 to 85. Uh, we can change it to any debt level we want and see what the impact is, and then also see uh, what the impact is of results exceed expectations. Now that we've seen how to interpret share value calculation in a normal situation with the Medigliano and Miller results, let's go back and change it the way we had it with uh, this being 3%. Now we have three ranges. And now we can see the optimal uh, weighted average cost of capital is down here at this lower range. Well, now as we go through and look at you know the same uh, current value uh, as far as uh, because the current situation hasn't changed that we're starting from, but now the optimal with a different whack, we get quite a different share value. Well, this makes sense because yes, we're 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 lowering the amount of debt, and therefore you would think that the uh, share value would, would go down. But because we're, we're dealing with a lot lower cost of debt than we were in this middle range, that's what's causing uh, the value of, of share to go up, even uh, though we've got less amount of debt. It's just much less expensive debt than we had before. You next want to briefly talk about 
um, the possibility of, of lowering the, the debt, the capital, all the way down to zero. Uh, some people think that, that uh, there's occasions where having no debt could be the optimal capital structure. But that runs counter to the Minigano and Miller results. This can be easily shown by simply just focusing on this middle group here and we'll lower the debt down to zero percent. And just like the graph shows that as you lower the debt down, the cost of equity eventually equals the unlevered cost of debt. As you can see these two numbers here. But the weighted average cost of capital has increased compared to at the other extreme where we have the weighted cost of capital being 4.6%. Now when uh, debt is zero, the uh, weighted average cost of capital equals the unlevered cost of equity. So lowering the debt to zero raises the weighted average cost of capital. The Manigliano and Miller results apply when the interest rate on debt is held constant over the range of debt to capital being considered. And the interest rate on debt is lower than the current cost of equity. This is normal because a company is contractually obligated to pay debt holders. Contracts typically include covenants that when violated result in collateral being forfeited. There is no such contract between the company and stockholders. Without guarantees, the risk assumed by stockholders is greater than that for debt holders. Thus, stockholders require a higher rate of return. I next want to talk about some uh, more subtle things dealing with uh, Medigliano Miller results and the capital asset pricing model and uh, some things specific to the, the spreadsheet. The first is when you enter in cost of debt, uh, you should be entering in the current market yield on the debt and not the original cost of debt when the bond was first issued. Since we are attempting to calculate the current cost of equity, we need to uh, also have a current, essentially, cost of debt. Now, that distinction is called out here uh, over here to the right if you want to uh, read through this but it boils down to you know, specifying that the your cost of debt kb in this spreadsheet should be what you multiply by the current market value that then will equal the rate that you initially or issued the, the debt at, and therefore the, the principal uh, uh, original principal of the debt Okay, next, we want to talk about whether the major results of uh, Medigliano and uh, Miller uh, calculations, whether they apply when you're dealing with uh, a cost of debt that is not the risk-free rate. Now, Medigliano and Miller, back in the 50s, when they came up with uh, their results, they guaranteed the existing debt did not change value by assuming corporations borrow at the risk-free rate. Since then, more sophisticated techniques have been developed that allow us to test relaxing that assumption. So if we relax that assumption and now allow a rate of debt that is not the risk-free rate, do these results here still hold? Well, it turns out that they do. Well, I'm not going to go through the detailed analysis in uh, this video. I suggest you stop the video and uh, read uh, what's shown here. But basically it's showing that like here uh, that the main proposition one of Mendigliano Miller does hold when you have risky debt and it goes through the calculation here. Uh, the whack that they calculated also uh, holds when you have uh, a rate of debt besides the risk-free rate. And then um, this this uh, alternate expression uh, for the WAC also holds. 
and um, the forecasted cost of equity holds as well. Next we're going to see how the capital asset pricing model holds up when relaxing of uh, using uh, cost of debt besides the risk-free rate. Well, what's shown here is uh, some calculations that uh, were done to uh, combine the capital asset pricing model with the Minigliani and Miller results. And unfortunately, uh, by relaxing that assumption of risk-free rate, it, it doesn't hold up when applying capital asset pricing model because in order to get the same forecasted cost of equity that uh, Nigliano Miller came up with, uh, the capital asset pricing model requires that the uh, cost of debt be at the risk-free rate. And that's actually uh, shows up here where you end up with a term that is essentially is the unleveraged cost of beta minus the risk-free rate. So when you um, bring it down here for uh, an equivalent expression of cost of equity, it, it requires the risk-free rate. So that's why in the spreadsheet we see the distinction between the risk-free rate that's being assumed and the cost of equity for these different ranges. And uh, there is an override here that if we, uh, and that's why these values here are grayed out because they're not going to be equal when you uh, attempt to calculate cost of equity uh, using the capitalist at pricing model. Then the, the whack that comes from that and then the unleveraged uh, cost of equity that uh, is downstream further than that are not going to equal. So uh, they're grayed out. But if you wanted to see the impact of setting the risk-free rate and the cost of debt to the same value, then you will see that they all equal now. But the default value is this, because it's not realistic to think corporations can borrow at the uh, risk-free rate. One remaining thing to discuss related to the relaxing of the uh, cost of debt from being uh, risk-free, question comes up, uh, how does it impact the uh, calculations of the unlevered and levered uh, betas? Because those are capital asset pricing model related. Well, the good news, it doesn't impact that result. And uh, comes down to the fact that here's an expression for the cost of equity based on uh, combining the Migliani and Miller uh, results and uh, cap M results and uh, eventually you can derive that even uh, even with a, a relaxing of the uh, uh, cost of debt not being risk-free that this relationship between the uh, levered beta and the unlevered beta uh, holds up and the reason for that is is that the um, portion of the of the formulas that incl include RF uh, can be divided out and just leaves the leverage beta and this portion over here uh, that includes the uh, unlevered beta. If you're interested in, in using this spreadsheet, you can download it from the Polaris Investing website. Take the Dropbox link, go to the uh, folder Oh, Polaris website videos and there go to uh, finance topics and get the spreadsheet from there. Well, the um part of this, this video, we're going to be talking about the um, derivation of uh, the Benigliano and uh, Miller propositions one and two. So if you're only interested in, in really the outcome and how you would use uh, the results of, of the propositions, uh, then I suggest you uh, stop the video. But if you have interest in knowing uh, kind of the, the, the details uh, or the, uh, behind the derivation, we're, we're going to go into that now. So first off, what I'm showing here at the top uh, right, uh, I apologize for this, the handwritten note, but it is a uh, convenient way for me to uh, go through this. We're going to go through the derivation of the Milliganani and Miller Proposition 1 in the scenario of taxes. 
And the way that they they went about uh, deriving uh, this result is they used it arbitrage argument. Today the approach is generically referred to as replicating portfolios. This was developed way back in 1958. It was developed over a fairly short period of time as they were preparing for teaching for the first time a, a corporate finance class. And they were both Modigliani and Miller were economists. And um, so they came with that background and just felt like the, 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 there was a lacking uh, information in this area. So they, they banged out, uh, according to the story, over the summer as they were preparing to teach in the fall uh, these propositions. Well, anyway, they were the first to, to really apply a uh, arbitrage uh, argument into, uh, uh, into the derivation of their formula. So what, what they start off with is, is uh, two different ways to uh, finance a company. One was to uh, uh, sell s stock in a leveraged company uh, in, or for a, let's, let's go the other way say you're an investor it would be that you would buy a stock in a leveraged company and then the uh, the company since they're leveraged they would earn uh, some net operating income but they would have to subtract off the cost of debt they get a tax benefit so they're only subtracting off the after-tax cost of benefit and that essentially be the net income well another option for a stock for an investor would be to buy an unleveraged company but borrow 1 minus T times B um, and so the total out-of-pocket would be the uh, subtraction off of that so you you, you pay for the uh, market value of, of the unlevered stock but then you you subtract off the uh, the amount that you're you're borrowing the payout would be the net operating income of the unleveraged company, and there would be no debt from the uh, company itself, but the individual would have to pay KB on the amount of money that they uh, borrowed. This assumes that the individual borrows at the same rate as the company. Well, you will notice that with this rather contrived amount to borrow, the payouts between the two scenarios are the same. There is a fundamental law of finance known as the law of one price, which states that two investments with the same payouts and the same return have the same value, thus should cost the same. But the reality is, is that because in this first scenario where there is a tax advantage to the corporation taking on the debt, whereas in the second situation there is no tax advantage to the individual uh, taking on the debt. The result of these having the same return is that when I set these equal and uh, do the algebra, what you're going to you see here is essentially the value of the unlevered minus the tax benefit equals the value of the leverage. In other words, it ha the unlevered company has to be valued at a little bit of a discount to the value of the levered company because of the lack of the tax tax benefit of debt. And when you uh, move things around, I think you see here that uh, you get the uh, Medigliani and Miller proposition one in a world of taxes that a value of a levered firm equals the value of an unlevered firm plus the tax rate times the amount of outstanding debt. Next we're going to uh, derive this formula here that is uh, known as the Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1 in a World of Taxes applied to capital budgeting. Um, and now the way that that uh, is done is that you, you notice uh, that the value of a leveraged firm using this result here from the, the uh, Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1 uh, you just calculate the value of an unlevered firm and then add the, the term uh, plus T uh, times B. Well, the value of an unlevered fir firm is the net operating income after tax divided by the expected rate of return, which for an unlevered company is its cost of capital, KU. That's derived from what's called the earning capitalization model, where you assume that, uh, that the company has reached equilibrium, where it's earning uh, a rate of R on its projects exactly equal to 
uh, the expected rate of return of, of, of KU. Now, if you want to um, go and uh, see more of exactly how that earnings capitalization model uh, is derived, I suggest you go out to the valuation concepts playlist on the YouTube uh, Plurus Investing YouTube channel and watch this video called multi-stage approximation. We we'll go into uh, uh, a great amount of detail in terms of how to uh, uh, where this earnings capitalization model comes from. But suffice to say, if you assume the rate of return on uh, projects equals the expected rate of return, uh, you end up with this expression for the uh, value of an unleveraged firm. And because of prop, uh, uh, Migliano and Miller Proposition 1, you can restate it uh, as shown. Well, by doing a little algebra, you can get it down to this formula here and then calculate for the value of a levered firm. And the value of a levered firm is net operating income after taxes divided by this expression here. Now you notice you get a little bit of a circular logic because what you end up with in the denominator is T times B divided by the value of a levered firm. But that's what you're solving for is the value. So you, here you have value of a levered firm expressed in the terms of a value of a levered firm. Well, the way you kind of break that circular reference is you realize that there's multiple ways to express the value of a levered firm. Uh, one is, uh, um, is you can just say it's the debt plus the uh, value of the outstanding shares of stock. Or you can even uh, go back to this expression here where it's the value of a leveraged firm is the value of an unleveraged firm plus the uh, tax rate times the uh, amount of outstanding debt. Or you can express it like we are showing here in the formula, which is kind of circular. Well, if you substitute this way of looking at value of a leveraged firm, namely debt, uh, the value of the debt plus the value of the outstanding shares, and you plug that into in, in replace of the value of, of leveraged firm, then you've, you've got um, this expression that we see over here, namely debt divided by debt plus equity, and then the, the T, then 1 minus, then KU is equivalent. The value of a leveraged firm equaling to the after-tax operating income divided by the weighted average cost of capital simplifies capital budgeting because it separates operating and investing in the numerator from financing in the denominator. This is the primary legacy of the Benigliani and Miller propositions. Well, next we're going to talk about the derivation of the Medigliani and Miller Proposition 2 in a world of taxes, which is the main formula that uh, this video is, is pretty much about. And that's shown here over to the right. Before uh, we get into that, I want to back up to what we just talked about and uh, mention uh, something else that, that uh, we did here at the very last step where we substituted for V of L, uh, B plus S of L in order to get this formula that's shown over here to the left. Well, that is a little of a uh, kind of a uh, problematic area of uh, Medigliani and Miller propositions. Is Now, what do you use for the uh, price of debt and the price of the, uh, of the stock? Well, the price of debt, you can use market value, and, and, and that's a fairly uh, reasonable way to, to, to uh, calculate the B value. But SL is actually based on uh, the, the KL, and the value of the lever. In other words, it, it, how do you really determine S of L when that's pretty much what we're trying to do with, with, uh, with uh, these formulas? Well, what you do is you just go out to the market and look at the market price. And you assume the market is typically efficient and gets prices uh, reasonably close to true value most of the time. And we know that this isn't always the case. The market can have and does have bouts of inefficiency, primarily from uh, emotional irrationality. But uh, uh, really, that's the way you do it to kind of break this circular, circular reference, is you just uh, use the market to uh, bring in a, a, a reasonable price for the, for the uh, value uh, of the stock. Now this is uh, obviously less than um, ideal, 
but it's better than using book value or, or other means of determining what to use for uh, the value of the stock when you plug it in into this formula. So the uh, uh, kind of convention is to just go with the uh, current uh, outstanding shares times the, the current stock price uh, to calculate the current uh, value of the stock of a leveraged firm. All right, so back to where we were uh, going is uh, here we are with the, uh, the formula that comes out of the Bedigliani and Miller Proposition 2. Uh, we're also going to be proving, uh, once we, we determine that for, where that formula came from, we'll then uh, finish up with applying uh, that formula to uh, the calculation of a weighted average cost of capital. And that's a formula that most of us are, are pretty familiar with. All right, so let's get into the proof of this. Digliani and Miller Proposition 2 in a World of Taxes. Again, the value of a leveraged firm is the net operating income after taxes divided by the uh, unlevered expected uh, stock return plus T of B, and that's coming directly from Digliani and Miller Proposition 1. Uh, you rearrange the terms and you get this expression here. Now let's start, uh, let's just uh, start a new uh, uh, train of thought here. And let's talk about net income. Net income is net operating income times 1 minus T minus the debt after tax. Now if you take the, <coughs> the result uh, that we uh, had just derived earlier and substitute in for net operating income after tax this expression here, uh, you can end up uh, moving some things around and you end up with this last expression. But we'll notice that the value of leverage again is the uh, another way of doing it is the market value of uh, uh, outstanding shares plus the market value of debt uh, is equivalent to your net income. So then what we do is uh, we realize that the, this another way to express the value of a levered stock is the net income divided by the cost of equity of a, of a levered firm. And then rearranging terms, we have an expression now for the uh, levered cost of uh, equity equals net income divided by the uh, value of, a, of the leveraged stock. Now, the, back up a little bit, this expression here is assuming that we've reached a point of equilibrium where any projects are uh, earning exactly KL, which is the cost of equity of a leveraged firm. And that's called the earnings capitalization model. Well, anyway, back to this. We have this expression here. Well, we've calculated earlier what net income is. So we substitute for net income this expression here. And you end up, and now you break it up in, into uh, this expression. You start just doing algebra. And you end up with Digliani and Miller Proposition 2, namely that the uh, expected rate of return of a leveraged company stock is the unlevered plus uh, the uh, debt over the uh, outstanding uh, value, which is the market after tax, and then uh, KU minus KB. Let me make sure we point out that uh, in this Modigliani and Miller Proposition 2, that you end up like the Benigliani and Miller Proposition 1, as applies to capital budgeting, a little bit of a circular logic because in the formula you have uh, SL uh, here, and SL is also equal to the net income divided by KL, but KL is what, you're, what the formula is solving for, but so indirectly you have a formula that uh, is a function of itself. KL equals something but with KL in it. Well, the Benigliani and Miller Proposition 2 assumes that the company itself, the operations and the side of the company and investments and all that kind of thing don't change. The only thing we're changing is how the company is financed. And so the financing pie, which equals the value of the leveraged company, marginally increases by the tax savings from additional debt. More significantly, the mix of stocks and debt changes. So in this formula, as you increase the bond portion, you're actually decreasing the financing, uh, the stock financing uh, of the firm. 
Now as you do that, KL increases, causing the stock price to decrease. The amount of stock is actually uh, decreasing because bond uh, as you increase the amount of bonds, it's assuming more and more of the financing of, of the company. So the stock value becomes less and less as uh, the return on the smaller portion of stock increases. So instead of changing the value of debt in isolation and then attempting to determine the resulting value of stock or, or worse using the existing value of stock, it's more straightforward to change the percent of debt to capital and then calculate a new debt to stock ratio. The way that's done, for example, is let's say uh, we want a new uh, target debt to capital of 60%. We would use this relationship here to determine the new debt to stock ratio, which would be 1.5. Okay, next thing is we're going to show that the Magnigliani and Miller results are consistent with the uh, well-known WAC formula. So if we uh, scroll down here a little bit and um, focus on this piece down here, we have from Magnigliani and Miller Proposition 1 applied to capital budgeting. This formula here, so it's uh, restated here. And then uh, what we notice here is from the uh, uh, previous derivation that we went through that we had this formula here, but if we now solve for, for KU, we have this resulting formula here. Well, we can, we can restate um, this formula as stated here and then plug in this equivalent expression for KU and then do the uh, algebra and then you end up with the well-known weighted average cost of capital consisting of the proportion of stock financing versus debt financing and one's multiplied by the leveraged cost of equity and the other one's the after-tax cost of debt. Okay, we covered a, a fair amount of ground in this uh, video. To uh, edit out, this video discussed the Bidigliani and Miller propositions in a world of taxes. Proposition 1 states a leveraged company is worth more than an unleveraged company by the tax rate times the outstanding debt. Proposition 2 states that the stockholder expected rate of return increases if the company takes on additional debt. The value of a leveraged company increases as debt increases because the additional earnings realized from the increased debt tax benefit more than offsets the increase in stockholder expected rate of return from the increased risk uh, due to additional debt. Just like the private equity firm did when it bought out Gibson greeting cards, an investor should look for a company that is consistently earning a rate of return on investment greater than the cost of debt and is increasing its debt, resulting in a lower WAC. If the impact of increasing debt is not fully accounted for in the current price, additional returns are possible. The stockholder needs to consider if the increase in debt is large enough to generate significant additional returns. All right, thanks for watching.